A new commit at the most important position on the football field. A new transfer leaving the Pitt basketball program. And, oh, look at that. The ACC is made up like one-fourth of the Sweet 16. How about that? It was a busy weekend in Pitt sports. I thought we'd talk about like one story, but then things kept adding up. And so we're going to talk about all the stories to get you a little weekend recap here on the Morning Pit, the Monday edition to get your week started here on YouTube.com slash Pentelaire.com. Yeah, it's a Monday edition of the Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash Pantholair.com. I'm Chris Peak from Pantholair.com. You see the website below, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. The most comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. We cover it all at Pantholair.com and message boards interact with hundreds and thousands of other Pitt fans. All day, every day, Pitt fans are hanging out on the message boards at Pantholair.com talking about what's going on in Pitt sports, what's, talking, what's going on in Pittsburgh sports, what's going on in the ACC, what's going on on the national scene, everything Pitt fans are talking about right there at panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, and our YouTube channel right here, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com is the place we do all of our Pitt video content, these daily morning Pitt videos, Monday through Friday. Uh, every day of the week, a little bit of pit sports talk to get your day started. We have our weekly live show every Wednesday night at eight o'clock. We do post game shows after road basketball games and every football game. We won't have any of those for a little while. Uh, and then we have, um, you know, just other video coverage, press conferences and interviews and highlights and all those kinds of things. We've got video highlights from um, spring practice. Uh, we got, you know, post game, post practice interviews, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of pit video content. If you're a pit fan and you want to watch pit stuff, the place to do it is right here at youtube.com slash pantholaircom. That's the, that's the way you can uh, uh, stay up on everything and, you know, get a little pit sports talk, a little pit video content throughout your day. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of it, do what we always say. Well, uh, subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantholaircom. And while you're at it, like this video. That'll be uh, really cool. That way you won't miss any of our pit video content. Um, a bunch of stuff going on over the weekend. It turned out to be a pretty busy weekend for Pitt. Uh, this last, uh, you know, I guess not, you know, our, this next to last weekend in March 2024. Penultimate weekend of the month ended up being a pretty busy one. And we'll start on the football recruiting side where Pitt landed a quarterback. Got a quarter, quarterback commitment. For the recruiting class of 2025, Mason Heinzel, a, uh, a quarterback prospect from Oregon, Ohio, <laughs> Oregon, Ohio, uh, Clay High School in Oregon, Ohio. I didn't know that Ohio had a town called Oregon, but actually there, there's a place in Ohio called Delaware, too. I wonder if Ohio just is filled with like cities and towns named after states. Those are the only two I know of, Delaware and Oregon. There's probably a Washington Ohio. Is there a California, Ohio? I'm not going to look this up. I know there's a Lima, but that's that's like Peru. That 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 doesn't help us very much in terms of states. But I wonder if there's like a South Carolina, Ohio, or a South Dakota, or Ohio. Is there a Minnesota, Ohio? We're going to have to look all these things up. Somebody who's got time, one of you guys who always watches these videos and, and always has good comments and things like that, look up and find out if there's a town in Ohio named after each of the 50 states. We know of Oregon and we know of Delaware. Um, and I, and I know of Delaware cause I was just in Columbus over the weekend and that's, that's just outside of Columbus. So, you know, I, I I'm aware of that one, but see if you can find every, is there a, uh, you know, is there a Pennsylvania, Ohio? That'd be pretty great if there was a town, you know, called Pennsylvania in Ohio or New Hampshire, Ohio. All right. I'm going to stop now, but you get the point. Uh, anyway, Mason Heinchel, uh, a quarterback prospect from Oregon, Ohio, Clay high school. Um, he's listed at six two, two hundred 200 pounds. You know, you always take those listed heights with uh, a grain of salt. But I think when you look at his film, uh, both football and basketball, I mean, he might be playing with some shorter guys. And look, I'm, I'm not going to say that Clay High School plays a particularly high level of football, uh, but he's got some decent size. If he's not 6'2", he's 6'1 and a half, you know, maybe 6'1". Uh, but I, I think he's he's got some decent size. But the key with Mason Heinchel is that he's a dual threat quarterback. The first time uh, we interviewed him after Pitt offered him, uh, I think it was in January. Uh, let me just double check that. I should know that date off the top of my head. Um, we interviewed him. Yeah, it was early February when when Pitt offered him. Cade Bell uh, offered um, Offenheinchel and uh, offered Heinchel in 
February, and when we talked to him, he, he described himself as an improviser. He said that's that's what he does. He does. He he's he's an improviser, um, and I think that comes through in the stats. He had more than three thousand total yards, scored more than thirty touchdowns. He had seven hundred. I think he had, I think he told me he had three thousand eighty yards last year total yards. Um, last season had thirty three total touchdowns. About seven hundred of his yards came running he said quote I think I'm an improviser for sure I think a lot of what people see in my film and what I see in myself is the ability to extend plays to be off script with that kind of stuff just a lot of my throws are getting out of the pocket and making plays with my legs so definitely an improviser and you see that in his film I mean he's out there he's running around he might scramble a little bit to try and pick up a first down but he's running to try to extend the plays and find options downfield and throw the ball that's what he's looking to do. That's how he ends up with 3,000 yards and 30-some touchdowns. Um, and, and he's interesting, and, and I think it was not that long ago, we kind of broke down the quarterbacks that Cade Bell had offered um, so far. And, you know, It was like three or four guys, and, and we sort of compared and contrasted those guys, trying to find out what kind of quarterback Cade Bell is looking for. And we, we tried to evaluate this and that. Well, this guy does this, this guy does that. All of them had some amount of running ability, whether it was to be a pure like runner that you're going to call design quarterback runs with, um, or a guy who could scramble and keep plays alive, either to keep plays alive and run for a first down, or keep plays alive to to keep you know his eyes downfield and try and make throws. Cade Bell seemed to favor mobile quarterbacks. Now that doesn't necessarily mean anything unique for Cade Bell. Uh, but you know, because I think everybody wants a quarterback who can run. Everybody wants a quarterback who can move around in the pocket and outside the pocket. It's uh, you know, it's understandable. Uh, but I do think you know, Cade Bell does want some mobility with his quarterbacks. I, I think he, you know, he had a quote where he said, "Look, if we had Tom Brady, I believe we can win with him. If we had, I think he said Lamar Jackson, I believe we can win with him." Cade Bell does seem like he believes he can adapt his offense to any quarterback he's got back there, and, and that's good because I think he's finding some different skill sets uh, with the guys on the current roster than what he had at Western Carolina. And we can we'll, we'll talk about this more later in the week about how he he mixed it up with the quarterbacks at Western Carolina. Sometimes he had guys running more, sometimes running less. Nevertheless, uh, Mason Heinchel comes in as the quarterback commitment, and. I'm not saying he's the prototype for what Cade Bell wants in a quarterback, but if we view him as something of a uh, sort of an ideal target for Bell, I mean, this is somebody that Bell was you know offered in February, two less than two months after he got hired, and someone who you know whose commitment he was willing to take in March, uh, you know, I think that puts him somewhat high on the priority list and somewhat close to a model of what Bell is looking for in a quarterback, um, and so. You know, if we look at it that way, I think with Heinchel, you see a guy with a pretty strong arm, pretty decent accuracy, and again, that mobility, that improv, you know, improvisation, you know, the, those skills of being able to improvise, keep a play alive, and and move around and, and do things. You know, I think that's what really stands out with Heinchel. Now, it's March; it's a long time until signing day. It'll be interesting to see. What happens, uh, you know, his his offer sheet's not great. I mean, we're not going to uh, pretend that it's something different um, than it is. Heinchel picked Pitt over offers from Akron, Bowling Green, Coastal Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, Kent State, Liberty, Ohio, and Toledo. Uh, you know, no other power conference offers, all like MAC offers, basically. Uh, and, and that's the level he was getting recruited at. But Cade Bell clearly sees something he likes and feels like this is the kind of quarterback who can fit in his system and run his system and so he's bringing him in so we'll see uh you know it'll be interesting because coming up here about a month from now basically mid-april through the end of may we get into the evaluation period where college coaches can go on the road assistant coaches at least can go on the road and evaluate these quarterback evaluate prospects in person watch them work out in spring practice or whatever their teams might be doing and so it'll be interesting to see if Mason Heinchel gets a little exposure during the evaluation period. If college coaches come to uh, Clay High School, maybe they get confused and they start driving across the country thinking they're going to the state of Oregon. And they're like, oh, look, we're already in Oregon, but it's actually Oregon, Ohio. What a comic twist that would be. And they end up going to Clay High School and seeing Mason Heinchel and getting really impressed. Maybe Dan Lanning gets lost on his way back to Eugene and finds himself at Clay High School. Uh, he's like, wow, I'm in Oregon already. This looks weird. 
Um, <laughs> but it'll be interesting to see once Heinchel gets a little more exposure, if he gets seen a little bit during the spring evaluation period, if he goes to any of the mega camps and things like that, we'll see how he's able to uh, progress if he opens some eyes. But I think we can look at this as Cade Bell identified Heinchel was one of his top four or five targets early in the process, relatively early in the process, and took his commitment relatively early in the process. Heinchel is finishing up his junior year of high school. He'll be a senior in the fall, and we'll keep an eye on how he does going forward. We'll talk more about the quarterbacks this week um, as well. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe tomorrow or Wednesday, using Heinchel as kind of a jumping off point. We'll talk about the state of Pitt's quarterback room. But that was, uh, you know, one of the biggest news stories of the weekend is getting a quarterback commitment. Another one, and you see it kind of right up there on the, the uh, you know, the, the, the run down there, the headlines, William Jeffress leaving Pitt going into the transfer portal. This came out on Saturday, I want to say it was. I, I forget. This was all, this all kind of happened over the weekend. Um, William Jeffress going into the transfer portal. I think we all viewed this as a possibility prior to senior night. Uh, thought it was, you know, there, there was probably a decent chance that William Jeffers would leave. And then on senior night, he walked. Uh, and, and I don't know if he necessarily had committed himself to transferring at that point. Uh, you know, Jeff Capel said that he had had no conversations with William Jeffers about his future, um, you know, for senior night. And, and Jeffers's decision to walk and participate in senior night, he has two years of eligibility remaining. You know, due to you know redshirting last year with the injury and the COVID year and all those kinds of things, but I think it was clearly a distinct possibility that he might. I, I think he had his own reasons for participating in senior night, but I think it was a distinct possibility, and, and I think we viewed it as a distinct possibility before you know senior night even happened, before he even chose to uh, participate in senior night. I mean, the reality was he just wasn't seeing time. He just wasn't in the rotation. The highlight of his season, you know what I mean, was when he defended Efton Reed in the game against Wake Forest at the Peterson Event Center in the second half. That's, I, I mean, like, that was that was his greatest contribution. A and that's not to, um, that's not to be crass about William Jeffers. I, I think he was a good team guy. I think he was a good part of the team. Um, I think his teammates liked him a lot. I, I think he was a good kid. I think he is a good kid. You know, he's getting kind of old now, but so I don't know if we can still call, still call him a kid, but you know what I'm saying? Like, he was a good person. He was a good program guy, and I think it was hard for him to miss last season. I, I think, you know, Jeff Capel even said that a number of times, that it was it was tough for Will Jeffers to sit on the sideline last year. And so to come back and accept not even a reserve role, but, I mean, a, a backup-to-backups type of role. Now, granted, he was primarily playing a position where the team's leading scorer and, you know, presumably best player was playing. Uh, and so you're going to be limited in the minutes that you see there. And, and again, his crowning achievement this past season, he was playing center. So, you know, that kind of tells you a lot. And he didn't even get in the last couple of games. And that's, you know, you felt like the writing was probably on the wall for William Jeffers. So now he's going to move on. Uh, you know, he'll move to a lower level, uh, hopefully find a level where he can play and contribute. I think it'd be great to see him have a two really, you know, have two really good, solid years to finish out his college career. That would be that would be nice. Um, with Jeffress going, joining Blake Henson and KJ Marshall, who were out of eligibility, and Federico Federico went into the transfer portal late last week. Pitt now has four players departing from the 2023-24 roster. That leaves four open spots. They have two recruits coming in: Brandon Cummings and uh, Amni Najai. Uh, and I and I apologize if I'm still butchering that name. I should have it down by now, but oh well. That's how I hear it in my head. So that leaves two open spots, and we've seen Pitt connected to a number of transfer targets. Uh, they've got two open spots to fill. I, I don't imagine they're going to go out looking for any other high school guys. I think it'll be all transfers, and obviously the openings are clear. They need a four, and they'd probably like to get a five. And if they lose one or more of the guards, they'll need some backcourt options as well but I think when you look at the two open spots they have right now it's it's all front court it's all forwards that they're trying to fill and you look at the guys they've been connected to so far it's almost all big guys post guys centers centers and power forwards right I mean that that's the focus while they continue to work on and wait for you know Jalen Lowe Bob Carrington Ishmael Leggett 
and, and we've talked about this before. I think I talked about it last week when I talked about the offseason priorities and what Pitt needed to focus on and what they will focus on and all of that. Uh, you know, Bob Carrington's going to take a little bit longer than the other guys because he's got a different kind of decision. It's not just a decision of going into the transfer portal or staying at Pitt. It's a decision of going to the NBA or staying at Pitt. And he very well may, and I, I kind of expect him to choose to um, – go into the NBA draft process, see what kind of feedback he gets, and then make his decision after that. And we'll see. We'll see what comes from it. Uh, but for now, I think the priority is on those front court options. And then the last thing, of course, we got to talk about, and I mean, how can we not? The ACC in the NCAA tournament, one-fourth, a full quarter of the Sweet 16 Teams coming from the ACC, Duke and Carolina, Clemson and NC State, a six seed and 11 seed fighting their way into the, uh, you know, into the, the sweet 16 with upsets. And now the little old ACC might only be a two or three bid conference in the NCAA tournament. They might only get two bids, maybe three. Well, they've got four teams in the sweet 16 and look, I'll sit back and I'll say it right now, okay? I, I've I've long felt, and I always I always dislike when people use the results of the NCAA tournament as sort of a, a referendum on the conferences and how the conferences were this past season, right? Like, oh, this conference did this, so clearly they were that. Well, yes and no. I mean, we're talking about this this one and done tournament produces wild crazy results and and it's just off center enough i think that you can't draw too many broad overreaching conclusions you know often the best team in the country wins the national championship that happens a lot but it doesn't happen every time because in this one and done game of basketball you know or this 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 basketball tournament featuring one and done games i mean the ball just bounces certain ways and it you just you know, it doesn't always fully, perfectly equate to the best team. And so, you know, I, I still think you look at the conferences overall, you look at the whole season, how a conference did, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm not sitting back and saying, oh, look, the ACC got four teams into the Sweet 16. Clearly, everybody was wrong about the ACC. I've, I've felt everybody was wrong about the ACC for two or three weeks. I didn't need the Sweet 16 to justify that. I didn't need the Sweet 16 to to you know, point to and say, oh, see, Pitt should have gotten in. Pitt played eight games against teams in the Sweet 16. They went three and five in those games. Um, but I wonder, and I meant to look this up, how many other teams played three games you know, or won three games against teams in the Sweet 16? I mean, like, you know, probably Duke and Carolina, but, you know, non-ACC. How many non-ACC teams won three games against Sweet 16 team. And, and it's funny, and I, and I said this on Twitter, and, and the reality is, like, especially since, you know, it's it, you now have this break, right? You have this break until Thursday um, when the games start up again. ACC people, and whether it's fans, whether it's schools and coaches, whether it's media, it doesn't matter. For the next four days, they're going to be so annoying. I mean, just incredibly obnoxious about all of this. And they have every right to because the ACC has had to eat crap for the last two months listening to how bad it was and how down it is and how it's not that good. And after Carolina, there's not really any great teams in the ACC. Wouldn't it be wild if they only got two bids and all this other nonsense? Oh, their non-conference schedules. Well, I'd say they acquitted themselves pretty nicely in the conference part of the schedule. And I think you're seeing teams, you know, you've got one-fourth of the Sweet 16. How many, how many uh, Big 12 teams got in? Eight? How many are left? <laughs> and, and again, like, ACC people are going to be really obnoxious about this. And I am not going to, like, I, I get annoyed with the triangle media as much as anybody, right? All, all these, these navel-gazing media guys in Carolina, like, they, they, they work my nerves just like they work yours. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I get, a, I get tired of hearing them go on and on about the ACC. But for this week, for the next four days, I'm right behind them. They, they you know, it's, it's, it's all solidarity in the ACC because, I, I mean, they're killing it. You know, they're killing it. 
you know, NC State, Clemson. I mean, shout out to them. I mean, Duke, Duke and Carolina have taken care of business. Shout out to NC State. Shout out to Clemson for battling through, getting some nice upsets and and fighting their way into the Sweet 16. And it'll be a, it's it'll be a good week for the ACC. It's going to be a lot of uh you know th- there're going to be a lot of uh, unpaid commercials for the ACC over the next 4 or 5 days. It should be fun to watch. Should be fun to watch. All right, we got a good week here coming up on the Morning Pit. We'll talk about quarterbacks a lot. We'll talk about transfers for basketball a lot. We'll talk about everything else that comes up a lot. So make sure you like and subscribe. Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. And then check out the uh, website below, pantherlair.com, to get all of your pit sports coverage. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a great weekend. Hope your Monday goes well. And we will catch up with you tomorrow on the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash pantherlair.com.